My name is Vince. My company's Tro. Uh, we're focused on building better building heating and cooling devices. Uh, I started this company because I love thermodynamics. Uh, I know everyone else in here loves thermodynamics too. And so I'm going to give a brief history of thermodynamics and specifically how we make things hot and how we make things cool, uh, what it means for society, and what work we have left to do. So it all started a million years ago. Uh, it was roughly one million years ago when uh, these two people, this is Vivian and Bob, they were sick of being cold uh, and they wanted a way to make their cave warmer. And so they realized that they could go out and they could find hydrocarbons on the ground in the form of dried hay or sticks. They could start an exothermic redox chemical reaction with them in atmospheric oxygen and that way make fire. And they did. And it was great and they were warm. It also became a social gathering point and let humanity push into more extreme climates. Uh, and we largely do it the same way today. We heat buildings the same way. We find a hydrocarbon and we set it on fire in our homes and then we're warm. Uh, so this has been great for us. Uh, the story of how we got to cool is a little bit longer, uh, but it actually started from the same place. It started from fire. And the next step is this person, about a million years later, and about 2,000 years ago, a person named Hero of Alexandria. He was a hero, and he's actually named Hero, and he was the first person to turn that fire into motion. This is a super critical point in the development of pretty much everything that we have in the engineered world. He had a sphere full of water. He had two nozzles leaving that sphere. He would put fire under the sphere, which would boil the water, which would shoot out of the nozzles and make the sphere spin on an axis. And this was cool. Uh, this uh, was largely just a demo and a toy, and he did no, no useful work with it. It took about another 17 centuries before somebody made a similar device that did useful work. It's now 1781. James Watt uh, makes the steam engine, which is not the first steam engine, but it's the first one that's efficient enough to be useful. And this is uh, largely what drives the Industrial Revolution. Uh, he, just like Hero's engine, puts fire in and gets motion out, but he uses that motion for steel mills and coal mining. And this is the device that's inspired our next hero, Sadie Carnot, uh, to write a book he called Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire. Uh, he's a 28-year-old French engineer, and he wants to understand more deeply the theory behind devices like Watt's steam engine. He's fascinated with what they're doing and how they're changing the world, and he realizes that no one really fundamentally understands how they work. So he does a couple really important things. First, he categorizes these types of devices and calls them heat engines. He's the first person to do that. Instead of studying specifically Watt's engine, he thinks of them as a class of devices. He notices that you have to put heat in at a high temperature and then remove the heat at a low temperature, which no one had noticed before. Uh, and finally, he realized that the work that comes out of this is dependent on the temperature of the input heat and the temperature of the output heat. This becomes the second law of thermodynamics before we even had formalized a first law of thermodynamics or the mechanical equivalence of work. So we couldn't even convert work to energy yet. It's a really great observation that built the whole field of thermodynamics. And he did one other thing, which is really important. He said that the most ideal of these devices would also work in reverse. And what does that mean for a heat engine to work in reverse? You can't turn the crank on your engine and have heat come out. It doesn't work like that in your car. It means that there's a different device you could build that you put work into it, and it takes in heat at a low temperature and pushes it out at a high temperature. Uh, more practically, you can think, this, think of this as a machine that makes cold. And this is fascinating because he predicted this in his book before anyone had even built this machine. So this didn't exist yet. So he predicted air conditioners before they were cool, which is really amazing. Uh, and if you think about that, in 1824, if you were in San Francisco, you would have never seen an ice cube. There's no ice cubes in San Francisco in 1824. Um, you would only seen liquid and steam water. Uh, but a little bit later, around the turn of the 19th, uh, middle of the 19th century, you may have seen an ice cube, and it was because of this person. This person is not a thermodynamicist. This person was obsessed of, with building an industry around carving chunks of ice out of lakes and shipping them to warm regions and selling that ice. Uh, and so there was a giant ice industry around the middle, around 1850, and you could buy ice from the Tudor Ice Company. And then this person comes along. This is our hero of thermodynamics. This is Dr. John Gorey, a medical doctor who wants to make a machine to make ice. 
so that he can use that ice to cool his patients. And he does. And this is how the world responds in a world where you're buying ice from Tudor Ice Company. The New York Globe said, Dr. Gorey is a crank down in Florida that thinks he can make ice by his machine as good as God Almighty. So he builds the world's first ice machine, which ends up eventually changing the world, and the only thanks he gets is Florida man makes fake ice, uh, which is too bad. His company was never a success. He died poor. Uh, but he started the revolution in air conditioning that we have today. It was 50 years later in 1902 that the first air conditioner is used in a factory. It's a printing press. They use it to control humidity. Uh, 20 years later, movie theater business isn't doing so well, and they realize they can attract people if they have a comfortable environment. And so when it's hot out, you would go to the movie theaters to escape the heat. John Willis Carrier built both of these machines, and uh, he, uh, Carrier Company is named after him. In the 20s, we start to put it in our homes, and as a result, the U.S. has seen a 75% reduction in heat deaths since 18, 1960, only due to air conditioning. This is amazing because we've had heating for a million years, and we've had cooling for less than a century. So it, we're really early in the process of learning how to cool our world. Uh, this is another example of the benefits that cooling has had. Singapore's GDP grew about 100x over the course of three decades, from 1960 to 1990, all under Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. He was interviewed a few years ago, 19, uh, 2015, and asked to what he attributed Singapore's success. And he said air conditioning. He said air conditioning is what makes development possible in the tropics. He said we couldn't have had a productive workforce without it. Um, and so this is happening everywhere else. Uh, the stock of air conditioners has doubled since 1990, and it's expected to more than triple by 2050. And so we are just at the beginning of the hockey stick growth of these devices in the world. And this is a good thing. But this is the bad part. The gases that we use to drive these systems are not that easy. Uh, for about the first 50 years, 1900, 1950, we used ammonia, which is very efficient, but poisons humans. And so in the 50s, we stopped using it, which is great. We used what we call CFCs, common trade name is Freon. Uh, we used those for about 30 years, and it was great until we realized they're putting a hole in the ozone layer, which we didn't like. So we stopped using CFCs and moved to HFCs, and everything was great uh, until we realized that they are very strong global warming forcers. And so now the industry is figuring out what the next refrigerant is that hopefully doesn't have a new environmental problem. Today, air conditioning, this is air conditioning only, not including heating. If you include both, it's about the size of the transportation sector in terms of emissions. And 30% of it is due to escaped refrigerants, which means that once Colin and Andrew fix our energy grid and we have entirely clean electricity, we still have an emissions problem in the building heating and cooling sector. It's a similar story in heating because of escaped methane. So what I started my company to do is to get this left side graph. We want the growth in air conditioning that's predicted by this report without this right side graph. We don't want to do it with the devices that we have today because it will be catastrophically unsustainable. So our goal is to bring building thermal comfort to the next 6 billion people without catastrophic emissions and with systems that are easier to use and more comfortable. Thank you. And